Hello, everyone. I'm Trent Luce. Welcome to another edition of A Rural Route to the program where we get together every day at this time. Well, John Cincinnato, we do it Monday through Friday anyway. And what we do when we gather is address the issues between rural and urban America. For those of you that have been listeners for a period of time, you know that uh, for the past 20 years, I've attempted to wiggle my way through the web spun by the animal rights community, understanding who the players are, what exactly their motives are, how they create division to get what it is that they want. Coming to us today from the great Keystone state of Pennsylvania, John Sansonito does the same exact thing, only I understand he compiles a tremendous database and explains what their true agenda and mission is. A retired police officer, thank you for your service, John, and working as the, I believe it's the president of INA. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Trent. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, How long were you a police officer, first of all? I was a police officer for almost 14 years. In a larger city? Uh, I, I started out in York, Pennsylvania, and uh, ended my career as a detective working for the Cumberland County, Pennsylvania District Attorney's Office in the Criminal Investigation Division. So that naturally leads you into doing investigations, which is what we're going to talk about today. Well, I was a detective most of my police career, and uh, in uh, 2001, INA uh, recruited me out to, and made me an offer I couldn't refuse to jump out to the private sector and do similar to work, intelligence work, what I was doing uh, in law enforcement uh, for the private sector. So tell us about INA. INA is an international risk management and security consulting corporation headquartered in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we do a number of different things. Uh, we have about 230 employees worldwide. And uh, a major division of our company uh, works for companies specifically uh, combating the threat of extremist movements around the world. Um, so we work with corporations who get targeted by extremists. Uh, we also do security consulting work uh, for risk of terrorism, uh, domestic and international terrorism. And we've traveled the world working uh, predominantly within uh, the pharmaceutical and research industries to help protect them due to the threat of animal rights extremism and environmental extremism. I would be willing to bet, John, that it is one of the better kept secrets in the country about uh how extreme the threats to the destruction of property and in some cases uh, the human body because people think they're standing up for something like um, an animal that's used for research and we saw that come front I saw that come front and center from places like New Jersey And, and you know I think that most of these crimes committed under the banner of animal rights and and environmental extremism get unreported by the mainstream media. Uh, there's almost a war going on, if you will, uh, in in rural America, and it goes largely unreported by the mainstream media. Um, but there are many companies who are under a constant attack from animal rights extremism. Uh, there have been some very heinous uh, criminal acts committed by animal rights extremists around the world, uh, some things that would, would shock most people. Can you share a few of those with us? Sure. Uh, there, even if you, if you look internationally, there have been a number of different things that have happened, uh, including some of the more shocking things are, um, you know, going way back to 1982, a, a uh, bomb was mailed to uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain and, uh, and injured and blinded uh, um, a, an aide who worked uh, for the Prime Minister. Uh, there have also been some different incidents around the world where uh, people have been physically assaulted. The the head of uh, Huntington Life Sciences was walking out to his car in Great Britain, was assaulted by people with axe pick handles um, who beat him over the head. And when a neighbor came to his rescue, they sprayed them with mace as they, they tried to uh, to intervene. In California, much closer to home, uh, in 2003, there were two bombings uh, in uh, Emeryville, California, uh, at the Chiron Corporation, which was the, the second of those bombings, uh, there was actually a device placed to, with nails uh, that was meant to be a secondary device to injure the first responders. Luckily enough, that bomb did not go off, uh, but the individual who's uh, sought in connection with those bombings has never been caught. Uh, 
Um, he has uh, uh, been on the FBI's most wanted list, but has, has yet to been uh, caught. Uh, and I, I think one of the most heinous things that have been done was actually against the CEO of the Novartis Corporation, a major pharmaceutical company, who had his mother's remains dug up and stolen. And to this day, they are still holding those remains hostage, saying that they would only return the remains uh, if uh, the, the company stopped doing business with a particular company that tested on animals. And there have been several other grave robberies as well, where individuals have stole the remains of family members and then used that as leverage to try and get individuals to stop doing uh, animal research and or to stop doing business with companies who were involved in animal research. You mentioned California. Uh, but most of what you described happened in Europe and I think in particular in Great Britain. For 20 years, I've, I've told people that you watch what happens in England and it is a, uh, a foreshadowing of what will happen from the animal rights community and probably all across the board. But why is Europe so extreme and kind of like, uh, I hate to use the word, but the, the, the trendsetter in these tactics? You know, I think that's a, a difficult uh, concept to, to comprehend. But for some reason, Great Britain has been the uh, at the forefront of these uh, uh, extremist movements. The, you know, 80% of the crimes committed against uh, individuals in the name of animal rights have actually occurred in either the U.S. or Great Britain. And for, for many years, Great Britain led the United States in both criminal activity and protest activity. Uh, slowly, the United States has sort of surpassed them in the protest uh, arena, um, but they still usually lead the world in criminal activity. And that has spread as well to other parts of Western Europe. Um, but you just don't see these kind of things occurring in the rest of the world. Uh, some of the underdeveloped com- countries have occasional uh, incidents, uh, bombings and other things related to animal rights extremism. Um, but most of this is predominantly a U.S. and uh, U.K. problem. And, and you're absolutely right. The trends seem to start in the U.K. Uh, then they spread to the uh, to the west coast of the United States. Then they come in the east coast, and eventually they work their way into the middle of the country. And that trend uh, has been uh, prevalent throughout the uh, the last uh, 20 or 30 years. John, I like to use the fur analogy because all of those same trends started there. Um, there are I've talked to women in rural America who have been at some point in time afraid to wear their fur coat because they think they, there's a risk that they might get uh, blood thrown upon them. When, in fact, I can only personally document two times that ever happened, but they were two times that were well publicized. And so that seed was planted. But more importantly, and, and this is what we can't let happen, is it changes your daily habits. It changes your use of a renewable product to keep you warm because you have this. That, that's terrorism, isn't it, at the, at the core? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the sheer definition of terrorism is to use force or threat of force in order to bring back uh, or, or create change within society. So, so definitely these individuals, or many individuals at least affiliated with these movements, are willing uh, to do that. And they really do capitalize on fear. You know, they use monikers uh, such as the Animal Liberation Front in order to give the impression that they are everywhere uh, and also to invoke all the fear of past crimes that have been uh, occurred under that same moniker, um, when in reality, many of these incidents are very localized incidents. Uh, it's just that fear of being attacked by these extremists um, is pretty substantial. And I say all the time, whether or not you're in the agricultural industry or whether or not you're in the research industry or, or other industries dealing with animals, you probably have a better chance of being struck by lightning than you mm-hmm. do being attacked by animal rights extremism. Um, however, um, you can't underestimate the fact that there is a serious business disruption when it does occur. Um, but, but quite frankly, most of it is more fear uh, and misunderstanding of, of how the, these groups operate and their tactics, the way they organize and structure. I think most of America has a misunderstanding of, of how the, the, the groups organized and how things are really much more done on a local level than what they might think. Uh, I've got about 30 seconds, John, before a break. How long have you been in this and really delving into these terrorism issues? Uh, well, 
you know, really, I've, I've monitored terrorism most of my, my life, if you will, uh, being involved in law enforcement and organized crime things. Uh, INA has really uh, been, been actively monitoring this group since 2001, uh, creating a database, creating profiles of all the, the group leaders, understanding their structure, digging into those groups and, and monitoring their activity very intensely since about 2001. Mm. John Sansonito, my guest, coming to us from Harrisburg, PA. It's been too long since I've been in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He's not in Lancaster County, but it's just next door. We'll be back with more Roll Route right after this. We're going to talk about technology in every sector, including food production. Our sows are being fed as John and I continue to talk about the animal rights community because we have a computer doing it. There's a feed station in each pen. Each feed station will feed up to 40 head. Once they put their head in the feed station, the computer reads the chip and feeds the sow the exact amount of feed they should get on a 24-hour period. Our clock for the sow starts at 4 o'clock every afternoon. That's when they line up like milk cows waiting to get their daily allotment. More details about the MPS Agra system can be found at mpsagra.co.uk. Please note that I said Lancaster one syllable, not Lancaster, like all other I, out-of-state I noticed pilgrims. that. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I just had to prove to you that I've been to PA a lot. <laughs> definitely have. If, uh, if, you're, if you're definitely making that distinction because the locals do not like it when people have multiple syllables. And I also knew that you weren't from PA, but I, I didn't know if that was New Jersey or not. It, I, I, can, I travel enough that I can just about tell you what region of the country you're from. I, I get that a lot, but I think I, I sort of have a uh, a blended accent. I think from different places. Yeah, like that living in eight different places kind of screwed you up. Yeah, it did. Coming back, three, two, one. Welcome back to Rural Route. I'm Trent Lewis alongside John Cincinito. Am I doing okay with the Italian pronunciation, John? You you are doing just fine, thank you. That's kind of like saying you're not doing it totally right, Trent, but I'm going to just not mess with trying to fix you. <laughs> Most people get it but you're much worse, Trent. So that- <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I want to get it exactly right, so you say it for me. Uh, Sansonito. Sansonito. It's easy yes, after you say good. it. Yeah, so <laughs> that's important. Uh, so this is create the visual for the listener. You're basically in the security business uh, through INA companies and uh, different corporations would hire you to assist them with the security aspects? Is that how it works? Well, we do a number of different things. Uh, one of the things we do is physical security consulting. So we'll come into organizations, uh, talk to them about how they can improve their uh, security profile, both from a, uh, a procedures standpoint as well as physical security uh, we go in and, and analyze their physical security standards and help them protect themselves. But we also look at policies and procedures. We look at exposure. We look at the uh, risk and their exposure to social media and what their uh, key executives and employees are doing on social media and tell them, you know, what they need to do to privatize some of those things. Uh, and then we also track extremist groups around the world. I have about 20 full-time intelligence analysts that do nothing other than monitor extremists all over the globe. And as part of that, we create daily newsletters for particular industry sectors talking about what's going on within uh, those uh, those movements and helping protect them and giving them information so that they can make informed decisions about protecting their business models. So uh, at one level, I hate to even ask you this question, question because I don't want to assist them in uh, in their goal. But at the other side, it just irritates me to no end, John, the amount of money – that a company would waste because they need to protect themselves from an extremist who is not based in reality whatsoever. Have you ever, I I realize this is also your lifeblood, but in in the scheme of the big picture, uh, this is all just like an unnecessary cost that a company occurs. You see where I'm going with that? Absolutely. And, you know, when we do go into a company, we look at it from an all-hazards perspective, that in emergency preparedness, you're also planning for natural disasters and and uh, and other things that could affect their business model as well. Um, but I will say that it is, is absolute crime uh, to 
uh, when you add up all the dollars spent on corporations to protect themselves from extremist groups. And quite frankly, you know, companies have been completely put out of business by, by these extremist groups. Many research labs around the country are no longer doing important medical research because of pressure from extremist groups. Uh, many smaller uh, businesses, uh, you know, uh, animal breeders and even people in the agricultural sector and, and uh, people breeding animals for, for fur, uh, have been completely decimated and their family businesses have gone out of business directly because of pressure from extremist groups. Um, but some of the attacks by environmental extremists, like the, the burning of the ski resorts in Vail, Colorado, um, was millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the research laboratory at the University of Michigan was burned down uh, in, in cost, uh, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the horticultural laboratory in, uh, in Oregon and Washington states have been attacked. Uh, there have been many crimes across the country uh, and, and costing companies and and quite frankly, even taxpayers, millions of dollars in, in responding and the emergency services responding and investigating these crimes. So I've met Rodney Coronado, the person who did the University of Michigan lab uh, research lab destruction. Uh, I'll never forget that meeting. It was just the most emptiness I've ever seen in a person's eyes when I talked to them. And, and I don't know that he's the typical person in this community, but you obviously do profiles on the players that are involved as well. Uh, we do, and, and I'm very familiar with Mr. Coronado and, and his past crimes, yes. Mr. is uh, very kind to that person. <laughs> yeah, probably, uh, but uh, but lately he has uh, uh, changed his way, or at least have been less involved in, in the uh, uh, environmental and, and animal rights movements, uh, so he's in uh, you know, at least hiatus. Of, are are of, you saying uh, that after three stints in prison, maybe he learned something? Uh, it may have had something to do with it. But uh, where I met him was I was setting in a presentation when he would teach people. He was literally teaching people how to burn, bomb, and destroy property, and then how to deal with law enforcement when you're caught. I, I'm sitting there watching him sh- do a demonstration on how you do this. Nobody's uh, it, trying it, to hide it. And he's not the only one. The animal rights movement has many conferences around the world, and, and they have conferences directly on how to commit to what they call direct action, which is just a politically correct term for criminal activity. Uh, they, they teach activists how to do this. They teach activists. Uh, they have their seminars on uh, how to deal with law enforcement, what to do when the FBI knocks on your door, uh, you know, understanding your rights and and uh, and also how to occupy spaces, how to use iron dragons in order to defeat uh, and not be separated by law enforcement when you're doing an act of civil disobedience. Uh, the animal rights movement really has the, the largest gathering of animal rights movement is the National Animal Rights Conference, and that's held once per year. It used to be held twice a year. Now it's held once a year, and they alternate back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. And uh, every summer, activists from, uh, yes, and, and around the world, uh, the, the activists um, from around the world get together at this annual conference, and they talk about their tactics. They, they talk about what's working and what's not working. They talk about the different campaigns. Um, individuals who have been involved in undercover investigations come in and, and talk to the group on, on, you know, give them tips on how they can actually get hired by companies and work from the inside uh, to expose what's going on in their mind. Uh, you know, the exploitation of animals, uh, they, they, they treat these people like they are heroes and they, they are uh, local celebrities within that movement if they've done an undercover investigation. Yeah, that National Animal Rights Convention in Alexandria, Virginia, is the one I attended a couple of times and got to know most of the people involved. And it is, um, it's pretty startling how open and upfront they are and what it leads to, which I've never understood, and maybe you can explain, and we see this taking place now with the California group, which live streams all of their criminal activity and somehow think that that's okay. They create a cult following. And people will, and somehow it works, people will do anything because they think they're working for the cause, and the cause is just a criminal activity that the leader has persuaded them is, in, is just. Well, and I think that in order to really understand the destruction of the animal rights movement, you have to understand that there are really what we call three tiers of activism. So you have uh, your mainstream activism, which is your groups like PETA and Humane Society for the United States, and, and uh, many of these other groups that are operating uh, under that umbrella. 
Uh, they are usually 501c3s. They are registered nonprofits. They have an organizational structure. They have a physical address. Uh, they go out and organize campaigns, and they're 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 in on on Capitol Hill lobbying legislatures and and state representatives uh, to bring about change, uh, and uh, and they're pushing from that side. And many of the mainstream uh, public give money to those organizations, mostly under the banner of helping animals. Um, but, you know, despite the name, the Humane Society for the United States gives very little money to uh, local animal shelters. But most people, I think, mistakenly give money to that organization because of that. Half of one um, percent so to be exact. You're absolutely right. And, you know, there's a lot of money piling into that from the American public who really doesn't understand what the agenda of those groups really are. And they set the tone for the rest of the movement. So your second tier of activism are your grassroots collectives. These are the groups like Direct Action Everywhere and, and the Shack Campaign when it, when it was in its heyday and other groups that are going around the country and committing uh, protests and sometimes even committing uh, minor acts of vandalism and other things uh, for, for their cause. These are the groups more likely to be out there having rambunctious protests at your farm or, or at your place of business, and we call those the grassroots collectives groups. And, and don't get hung up on the names of these groups. These groups shed names very quickly. Uh, they'll, they'll operate under a name for a little while, and then they'll dissolve that group sometimes because they get injunctions against them or, or legal action against them, and then they'll just reform the same group of people under a whole new name. So don't get caught up with the names of the grassroots collectives. It means something to the mainstream activism because they're trying to solicit money and they have to register as nonprofit agencies. But the grassroots collectives, they shed names and reform under new names all the time. And then the third tier of activism is the smallest group of activists, which is really your underground extremism. And these are your groups that do things and commit crimes under the banner of the Animal Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Brigade, uh, the, the Earth Liberation Front. And this is really a small group of activists. And when I talk about, you know, this group of activists, I'm really comparing it to, you know, how many of your listeners uh, own a motorcycle? And of them, how many of them are involved in violent motorcycle games? Um, uh, uh, probably a very, hopefully none of your listeners, but a, a very small yeah, percentage possible, of motorcycle John. operators. Well, that's true. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, a very small percentage of motorcycle operators are involved in, in a motorcycle violent gang. Um, I look at that as, as well when it comes to animal rights activists. You know, there are millions of animal rights activists, or people would call themselves animal rights activists or, or supporters of animal rights activism, at least around the world. Um, only a very small percentage are actually willing to go out and commit a, a, a violent yeah. crime in the name of that movement to further it. John Sensenito, my guest. We have to take a break. We'll be back with the second half of Rural Route right after this. Welcome back to Rural Route. I'm Trent Luce, John Sensenito, my guest, coming to us from Harrisburg, PA, in the international security business, working against extremists in all phases of business. John, I'd like your take on this because my assessment is that uh, the individuals within any of the given organizations, I don't even like to name them because it gives them some level of uh, awareness, which they don't need, but ultimately we have to name a few. Uh, They really don't care anything about animals, but they have figured out, oh, for example, Ingrid Newkirk once said in a media quote with the New Yorker magazine, I'm really just a media whore. Uh, they have figured out how to utilize media. Social media and Facebook has elevated their awareness to a whole new level. But at the end of the day, what they really want is money. They don't care about the animal. They've just found a way to generate $150 million a year. Is that too simplified? No, it's really not. I mean, when you really come down to the the larger animal rights organizations and and a lot of these nonprofits, they are nothing more than a business that uh, isn't called a business. They're called a nonprofit, but they are very much operating uh, the way a lot of for-profit agencies are. They hire people to do fundraising for them. They draw out some pretty hefty salaries. Uh, Wayne Purcell, the, the former uh, president of the Maine Society for the United States, was making $356,000 a year as a salary uh, for being the head of that organization. Uh, many of these individuals uh, make a living out of this and work as if though they are an executive for a major corporation and run the organization accordingly. Yeah, not to mention his sexual perks with interns that don't consider, don't come onto the balance sheet. What he got away with in terms of sexual assault is unbelievable. 
Well, and I doubt we've seen the end of that whole situation. I, I have a feeling that, uh, that eventually there will be some lawsuits come out of that. Yeah. So it's big business. Have you put the numbers to how big the, the overall impact of these organizations actually is? Because I know Pete has doubled in my t- – apparently I'm not any good at what I've been doing for 20 years, John, because they've doubled their revenues in 20 years. Well, and, and I certainly wish uh, INA had those kind of revenues as well. Uh, but, you know, the, the one thing is, is when most people think of the mainstream organ, uh, animal rights organizations, they look at PETA and say PETA is the largest one, and really PETA is not the largest one. However, PETA is very good at hiding their, their actual uh, revenue in a way in that they have many subsidiaries. So, you know, a while back there was a movement to strip PETA of their 501c3 status, and uh, and that fell short, uh, but... Uh, but, uh, you know, so PETA started dividing themselves up a little bit, and they have many different nonprofits that are working under their larger umbrella. Uh, PETA's 501c3 is the last one I remember looking at, said that their annual uh, revenue was right around $50 million a year. Uh, the Humane Society of the United States, the last 501c3 filing I've seen for them, puts themselves at, uh, at about three times that amount with almost $150 million annually. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of money being funneled into these groups, and, and you know I think uh, when you look at uh, the ratings of these groups about how much of their money actually goes to advocacy programs um, versus how much goes to overhead expenses, uh, they really come up on the very low end of nonprofit agencies and the way they're organized and their efficiencies. It has become much more about making money than it does, you know, what they were originally designed to do, which um, was to, to, you know, bring about uh, better conditions for animals. Uh, and their mission has been radicalized over the years. I and mean, PETA was always a little bit more radicalized. Humane Society for the United States, when they started out, were a little bit more about uh, animal welfare, and, and they slowly shifted into an animal rights organization. Um, but make no no doubt, bones about it. These organizations, their intention is to end the use of animals um, in, in research, in clothing, in, in food. Uh, their intention is that animals will eventually have the same rights as humans and that they're, they, they're, they will not be allowed to use animals for any purpose whatsoever. Uh, I caught Wayne Pacelli at a Chicago animal rights convention once because uh, he didn't know I was there at the time he said it. Uh, he called dogs canine Americans. And I outed him on that and actually told people in a group setting at the University of Nebraska sometime later. And that got all that really got him his panties in a wad because it, it created the wrong image of what he really wanted people to think of him because he's all about image. But what you just said, people need to understand because if they can consider dogs to be canine Americans, they win. Absolutely. And, and they're slowly chipping away at this perception of animals over the years. So, you know, I think if you put them all in a room, they would openly admit that they know that they're not going to be able to achieve their goal in, in anywhere in the near future. Um, but, you know, they're not going for, for the kill right away. Um, it's a death by a thousand cuts. Uh, they're trying to slowly nip away and change the public perception about the use of animals. And they're, they're, they're winning a lot of that PR battle. They're, they're, you know, PETA has what they call PETA 2, which is meant through for K through 12. And that PETA 2 website is much different from the main PETA website. It's much more geared towards the younger audience. They have interactive games and things that it would appeal to younger kids. They're getting into the schools and they're, they're changing the perception. Uh, they're convincing school, you know, trying to convince uh, students to try and opt out of using actual live animals in science classes. Uh, they're, they're trying to convince people that uh, animals should not be used for clothing, should not be used for, for food, um, you know, trying to convince them to go vegan. And they are really having a, a huge impact on the use of, of our, our nation. Uh, they are chipping away at this slowly in hopes that when that generation comes up, they'll pass on that. And then, you know, they're slowly trying to work towards this goal. It's just like when you hear these lawsuits pop up about uh, PETA going after and filing suit to try and get uh, rights for animals, just mm-hmm. like a, a a monkey grabbed a camera mm-hmm. and took a, a selfie of themselves and PETA sued trying to 
you know, establish that the, the animal is actually a sentient being who has the rights to the photos and should not be exploited and so forth. They don't really expect to win those lawsuits, but they don't need to win it. It gets them mainstream publicity, and they're all about the publicity. So it got attention for their group. It got people talking about them. It got mainstream media talking about them. It got us talking about them. Uh, and that's really ultimately what they're doing is they want to keep this in the forefront of, of, of everyone's mind. Uh, and slowly they're going to implement and, and, you know, tighten the screws, if you will, to try and force out the use of animals by increased regulation, um, by changing public perception about the use of animals. Uh, they're, they're slowly chipping away at this. And unfortunately, the rest of the industry, um, in, in both the, the research side, the pharmaceutical side, the agricultural side, you know, farmers are busy doing what they do. Um, they're not out there organizing a, a campaign on social media to, to convince kids that, um, you know, what the realities are about, uh, uh, you know, feeding the, the, the world and also, you know, how humanely these animals are, are treated. Uh, they're not, there's no one really out there selling that side of the story. Yeah, John, I'd like, you know, I, I want to come back to something you said because it, that just happened this year where the chimpanzee took a selfie of itself and they somehow tried to bring, uh, it was very anthropomorphic, putting human qualities into that. And a San Francisco court ruled that it could not go farther, but we lost. We lost because of what you just said, and I want people to understand that even though the court ruled against this chimpanzee having standing to file litigation, people are still talking about it. You and I are talking about it. Media sources, and you can find it, it goes viral on social media. And at some level, each one of us who are opposed to that contribute to perpetuating that through the society, and I don't think we understand how good we are at doing their PR work. Yeah, it, you know, and, and I I agree with you. The fact that we are talking about it now on your show um, proves that they were successful, and this is exactly what they're doing. They don't really expect to win it. Um, they are all about the publicity. They are all about keeping it, it themselves and these issues being discussed within within uh, you know around the dinner table uh, on, on talk radio and other places. They're all about that, but eventually, what they're really doing is slowly. Uh, furthering their agenda in in the process. So you and I as business owners, we think about what our plan is for the next year, the next five years. That would be fair, right? Sure. I read the 1972 Humane Society of the United States vision, and it was not, and again, I'm repeating something you've already said, but I just want to take it to another level. It was not about what we're going to do in 1973, what we're going to do in 1980. It was about what can we accomplish in the next 50 years. That that, that puts it into context. There is no immediate need because, by the way, if they really got what they say they wanted, they would eliminate their funding source. So then they put themselves out of business. That's not the ultimate goal. Uh, but then in the other part of that, I don't think anybody's ever stopped to think about is this talk about HUS at one time in the height of their revenues when they were consolidating, uh, acquiring other nonprofits and bringing them into the fold. Their annual revenues were $180 million. You don't have to be much of a mathematician, John, to figure out that if your revenue is $150 million and you think that your money's coming from uh, we, we think their money's coming from uh, blue-haired old ladies that believe they're helping the cause. Do you know how many blue-haired old ladies it takes to send $25 a year to make $150 million? An awful lot, probably there's not, more than there are out there. There's not enough of them. And so they acquire these other organizations because there's always a big infusion of cash that comes along at the same time. It's criminal because there's something else you said that nobody seems to want to follow up on. They do start as 501c3s. 501c3s are deemed by the IRS as educational entities. You cannot lobby as a 501c3. Yet they do lobbying work state by state. I don't know how they get away with all of this, and they continue to get away with it. Oh, I got a problem, John. I set you up. I can't let you respond to that now, but we can do it on the other side. John Cincinnato, my guest, 
Sansonito. We'll be back with more Italian Talk 101 after this. Now let's talk about what's happening in the world of marketing cattle the superior way. Today and tomorrow are the last two days of the superior Bighorn Classic. 188,000 head of cattle have been selling this week. Full details on the website superiorlivestock.com. If you'd like to view the sale, Dish Network Channel 232, Direct TV 603, and superiorclicktobid.com. Coming up in a couple of weeks, it's the Labor Day sale. And uh, you know that we have an auction every Thursday. Every single Thursday, you can buy cattle via auction. If not on the video from the television, you can do it on the website alone. It all starts by developing the proper relationship with your rep. You find your rep if you don't have one at superiorlivestock.com. So see, everything we're talking about all comes back to one place, superiorlivestock.com, to market your cattle the superior way. Welcome back to Rural Routes. I'm Trent Luce, John Cincinnato, my guest. He liked that little Italian 101. We'll rename Rural Route to Italian 101. You should have more of a strong Italian. If you want me to really know your Italian heritage, you should be more strong Italian like a New Jersey Italian or something, John. <laughs> well, I am a New Jersey Italian, but I, I think uh, most of that uh, accent is... You, you don't sound like and, any and, New Jersey Italian I've ever seen on TV. You can't be... <laughs> yeah, well, we're not all uh, like they are on TV. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, so I, I went on that little rant before the end of the break. Was there a follow up to that, or I, I got a couple other things I got on my mind? But I want to make sure if you had something there that you had the opportunity to express it. And basically, the illegal activity that these organizations continue to do in the name of a five hundred one c three. Yeah, and I think these mainstream organizations set the agenda for the rest of the movement. So they identify the targets, and then typically the grassroots collectives pick up and start doing protests against those corporations. And then the underground extremism ends up committing crimes against those uh, organizations or companies um, who are identified. But it really starts with the with the mainstream activism group. They give a lot of financial support as well. Um, when the when the grassroots collectives end up going and doing protests. Most of the signs that they're actually using were supplied to them at no charge by PETA. So they call PETA. They say, we want to do protests in the name of animal rights. Uh, PETA will ship them signs. PETA will ship them brochures to hand out and other things. So people sometimes will think that they're PETA, but they're really not. They're grassroots people who are just being uh, supplied and in, in, in furthered by, by the nonprofit agencies. Uh, so I want one other thing I want to share about HSUS because it's it's still today the greatest misnomer. Um, a friend of mine and I, for several years, were really working on understanding the inner workings, and we had a strategy, and then it kind of fell apart, mostly because of us. But when people think about HSUS, they think about this big group, and their annual meeting must just be filled with millions of people, thousands, but they promote that they have two million members. So my partner went to two of their annual meetings. Would you like to guess how many people were in the room at HSUS's annual meeting, John? Not nearly as many as what most people would think. 24, counting my friend. <laughs> you know how long their annual meeting lasted? One day, eighteen minutes. <laughs> my no, point in less than I thought. Yeah, my point in that is that it's not an organization fielding what the people and the members want, and their members are just people who contributed. They're not members, and they get away with this in their lobbying efforts. But it is a top-down, the purest top-down organization. And what can we do to garner the most media attention to generate the most money? And that's how democratic. Their whole organization is. Their annual meeting lasted 18 minutes, with Wayne Pacelli giving a report for 13 minutes of that. Well, and even the conferences they organize uh, for the activists are not that well attended, and many of them, uh, you know, attendance has dropped off. So uh, they really are operating in a bubble of an organization. But with the kind of money they have, they can afford to operate that way. So a lot of the, of the groundwork you laid for us was about uh, research companies who continue to do great work um, alleviating medical conditions for people, utilizing an, um, a rodent to help us get that done. But it's obvious you're spending more and more time understanding and intermingling with the agricultural community. Kind of, kind of walk us through that evolution, if you would, please. 
Yes. And, and, you know, when, when my business model was originally, you know, formulated, we were talking uh, and working most with the larger pharmaceutical companies. Slowly we spread out, started working with the rest of the research industry. And, you know, I've always been a little bit of a science geek and, and I, I very much am fascinated by the science behind medical research and, and drug discovery. And so I've also have had many family members. I lost, lost both my parents to cancer. I lost a brother to cancer. You know, medical research is something that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I've always been very passionate about um, what they do and helping protect that industry. Um, but more and more lately, I find myself being graduated or, or gravitated towards the agricultural industry because um, when you look at the bulk of animal rights activity, when you look at the number of uh, criminal activity that has occurred, even in the first six months of this year, about 80 percent of those crimes have been committed against agriculture. And so more and more, I find myself uh, consulting with and and in fact, in about two months, I'm about to launch a uh, a newsletter for the agricultural industry, specifically on extremist threats to that industry, because um, quite frankly, that's the bulk of where the animal rights activity is. And that industry, unfortunately, is doing a very poor job of defending themselves in, in the, the realm of public opinion. There are some wonderful organizations out there that are spreading word, like the uh, Animal Agricultural Alliance and Protect the Harvest. Um, they're, they're wonderful organizations, but they do, cannot do enough uh, to get out there. And quite frankly, when you're talking about agriculture, you're not really talking about usually very large you know, multi-international billion-dollar corporations, you're really talking about family businesses who are not monitoring social media every day, um, who are not out there giving press interviews and other things uh, to promote their, their business. They're working in, in their business, in their, in their fields, and, and in their barns, and doing what they do. So they really rely on other individuals to help represent them to um, help turn back this tide. Yeah, it's now 20 years I've been telling people my – colleagues in agriculture we can't rely on that we need to each one of us be involved one person one day at a time but it's not what we're wired to do john we, we are wired to take care of the land the livestock improve the planet and improve human health and all of this other noise is just that it's noise we don't want to deal with that and i'm talking about we collectively as a community absolutely and you know it, the there's a lot of technology in the agricultural industry and some of the consulting projects that I've done for the dairy industry, I really realized just how much technology is there uh, in that industry, which was a real eye opener for me. Um, however, you know, you're not a group that is very good at going out on social media and manipulating people on social media, thankfully. Um, but unfortunately, the other side is. Um, the the modern day activism is really done through social media. Um, they have numerous accounts, um, and, and you know, typically, for instance, when a letter writing campaign starts, uh, a lot of people you know get bombarded by letters or companies or or even government officials get bombarded by people. But really, through the technology that's out there, a lot of these groups just have uh, created a list of hundreds of emails. And they automatically generate letters looking like it's coming from hundreds of individuals when it's really one individual with a computer that's doing it. So the, the activists are very good at manipulating that technology to get their side out. Unfortunately, you know, the, the good farmers uh, and people in agriculture in America are not doing the same thing. Um, but it, and they're really losing that battle. Uh, the activists are, are much more tech savvy and able to push out volumes of data um, where a lone voice uh, speaking out for the agricultural industry uh, is getting lost in, in all of that noise and all of that shuffle being pushed out by the, the animal rights community. So, John, when there's a, a protest that is uh, pretty large in my community, my community being agriculture, I, I go. The last one that I, I think I was really a part of was the uh, uh, pipeline in uh, North Dakota. I went there. I saw thousands of people displaying anger. I saw a, a very strategic method of how they were conducting these protests. I then went to the local casino, and I saw the two guys that were orchestrating and, and calling all of the shots and trying to generate the media buzz about what was happening. And now I see, uh, mostly through social media myself, the Antifa movement and the protests that occur in Portland or wherever it might be. And I see the same exact structure, and all of that tells me that these people locally don't just 
decide they're going to do a protest. Somebody is strategically calling the shots, and I think a lot of what was happening in North Dakota was just a trial run to see exactly how we can do this, what kind of media attention we can garner, and figure out how to be more strategic for bigger endeavors. And obviously now the case is um, an anti-Trump protest. Have you followed the money to see who exactly is pulling or calling the shots and putting together the strategy on how this is all put together? Because it's not done by the local people. It's really not. And, and there are really professional protesters out there that pick up different causes and so forth. And, and you know, I think there's a there is definitely some foreign money being pushed into, you know, these these uh, movements. Uh, you, you can't uh, eliminate the fact that there are probably some foreign governments and some other institutions that oppose our, our lifestyles that are uh, funneling money into these groups. Um, some of it's coming from the American public. Some of it's coming from their fundraising through selling, you know, uh, T-shirts and other things and, and member, uh, uh, merchandise uh, on, on their stores. Um, but you really, it's difficult to follow all the money all the way back. I'm sure there's some law enforcement people out there that have open investigations that are doing that kind of thing. But uh, from from the private side, it is very hard to track all the money. However, we definitely pull what uh, what we can. We we monitor that situation. We report it. Oftentimes, things that we find, we do pass on to law enforcement agencies. And uh, I can tell you though that you know they are very good at hiding their money and and hiding what they do. Uh, the organizational structure, on the other hand, you're right. I mean, there is a model that is out there. Um, but sometimes I think we give them a little too much credit to think that all of these different activist groups organize in one orchestrated way. I think it's much more that they develop a successful model for organizing people, organizing events, using social media, and then they learn from that model and the other activist groups pick it up. Um, but it's nothing to see, especially, you know, back when, when we were seeing really radical animal rights protests when they rioted in the streets of Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, you know, you saw, it was nothing to see anarchists side by side with animal rights activists. And anarchists would um, have a leather jacket and leather boots, and, and you'd, you'd, he'd be standing next to someone wearing hemp clothing and, and a complete vegan. And, you know, the irony used to, you know, strike me to say, these people really don't have the same views. Um, one feels that animals should not be used for anything else, um, should be not used for clothing or food or entertainment or research, and the other one is actually wearing animals as clothing right beside them. But they they follow the same goals, which uh, is to um, uh, rally out and lash out against society, change our way of life. They have an agenda that they want to push, but a lot of these people just protest for the sake of protesting. They join cause after cause after cause. Uh, it's nothing to see animal rights protests going out and joining uh, the Antifa movement. It's nothing to see animal rights people at uh, um, uh, other rallies for anarchism and so forth, or one day carrying an anarchist flag, the next day carrying a, uh, an animal rights flag. There's a lot of crossover between them. John, it has gone really fast. My thanks to Craig Curry, always giving me the best people. And uh, you mentioned Protect the Harvest, but certainly on the forefront, making sure that people are aware of these types of attacks and bringing me John Sansonito today, Italian 101, here on Roll Route. John, I think this is the first of many times you're going to be here, so I appreciate it and look forward to the time that we can sit and have a cup of coffee in the same location. Does that mean I'm going to have to change my Twitter feed now or handle to Italian 101? I'm good with that. At least I made an impact. We've successfully journeyed down the road connecting rural and urban America. Both John and myself remind you that all roads do lead to a rural route. When it comes to tender beef, nobody corners the market like the certified Piedmontese folks. Check it out, LoneCreekCattleCo.com.